Thank you. If you'd like to meet me in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 8, and uh, we're going to finish up the chapter this morning. Uh, Before we get there, and as you make your way there, um, last time uh, we spoke about the importance of seeing God rightly in order to worship Him uh, appropriately, and that we must be careful that in our dealings with God, uh, because it's far too common that we uh, approach God casually and and loosely. Uh, Today, we're going to continue on in this chapter, and we're going to talk mainly about money uh, and and what it is that uh, we could easily fall into if we are not careful. So let me read this, and then we will walk through this together, starting in verse 8 to verse 20. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he Go, and what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Verse 18, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. As we move into chapter 5, or move to the end of chapter 5, I ask that you consider something Um, important that this book has already brought out to us. I was thinking about that this week, and it's often that we hear this analogy that life is like uh, traveling down some kind of of path, Um, whether it be a dirt road or a brick road or a smooth road or rough terrain. Uh, Regardless, this analogy in all of its variety, it usually comes to this point where a decision needs to be made. Uh, We often call this a a fork in the road, if you will. And whenever I hear this example, uh, I always picture a long, extended break in travel, uh, that there's this opportunity for a slow and methodical choice to be made and to hopefully make the correct choice. Yet what we've observed so far in our time in Ecclesiastes is we see a rather different picture. Uh, Like the proclamation of the musical artist Tom Cochran, or uh, the more modern version by Rascal Flatts, life is a highway. Uh, Solomon is portraying this in a very clear way. That life is not necessarily an unknown set of stops, if you will, Um, that demand the uh, mental sharpness and fortitude of each one of us, but that life is moving at a much faster pace. What we've seen is that life is brief, that this is uh, quickly approaching the end, and that all of humanity, regardless, is headed to the same outcome. Remember, we talked about this. One of one dies. 
the outcome is death. We're all heading to that place. And that as we travel this highway, what happens is, is we are tempted to get off at exit ramps along the way. And we often do. And these are varied and they're numerous. That as we are flying down the highway at a rapid speed, there's that exit that catches our attention. Like my kids, when we're traveling, every time they see a sheets. Dad, can you get off? No, we just got off. You know, no, I just got to get a, I want to get an MTO. I don't even know what that is, but it's some kind of sandwich or something. But as we're traveling down the road, we're often tempted to get off at these exits, these exit ramps. And today we're going to talk about another exit ramp that we all tend to or could tend to get off on. And that's the idea of money, uh, earthly riches and wealth. Now, you may be saying, well, Jared, you know where I work, right? Um, you know, and, and I don't really think that's much of an issue. But I don't think that is the issue as much as um, the, the principle that we see in what it is that Solomon is teaching us. So as we are traveling down this highway, even if we get off at these exit ramps, we must remember that we hop right back on to the highway leading to death. We all still have eternity ahead of us. And so the question that I want you to consider is why then would you waste our time and your time with exits that lead you to nowhere? Uh, Solomon would say, again, that constant refrain, vanity, vanity of vanities, meaningless, pointless. Now, uh, to put to sleep this illustration of exits, uh, hopefully that brings more clarity to the feel of this book. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about money and earthly riches and wealth. Now, it's not my task, as some preachers do, to tell you what to do with your money. Um, nor do I believe that that's what Solomon's intention is. I think there's a principle here uh, that we must consider uh, more so than how it is that you should budget and use and save your money. Instead, uh, the counsel of this text for our, and for our time this morning is to see earthly riches and money rightly uh, and to clearly see the factors that accompany uh, an unhealthy relationship with these earthly riches. Um, I've become a fan over the years um, in ministry to talk about realities of life, not necessarily in the context of good and bad, but rather in the context of healthy and unhealthy. Because I think sometimes we can say, well, this is a person who handles their money in a good way, and this is a person who spends their money in a bad way. But I like to consider these realities, I like to consider all the realities that we face in life, and can we manage them in a healthy way, or do we manage them in an unhealthy way? And so what I think Solomon is doing here is bringing out this idea of health and um, unhealth, E. That's not even a word, but we'll work with it. And he's looking at this idea of riches and money. Now, in verse 8, uh, there's this rather thought-provoking statement, and, and he begins talking about the oppression of the poor and violation of justice. And this ties in with his previous com his comments that we've been looking at with this prevailing wickedness. And because of that prevailing wickedness, that there's this sense of injustice. And he basically self-admits that he himself in all of his God-given wisdom, couldn't eradicate it. That there is not a balance on the scales. That the rich oppress the poor. That those who are in high places stomp over those who are in low places. And so his counsel, and it seems rather pessimistic, is simple. Well, don't be surprised by it. It'd be like you walking up to somebody and, and pouring your heart out with a concern, and they say, why are you surprised by that? He's bringing forth a reality that exists in a fallen and broken world, that no matter where you turn, there is an imbalance of rich and poor. 
And that where money and riches abound, injustice is inevitably going to be present. Solomon, as his tendency has been throughout this book, is posturing himself as having a realistic view of the human nature. You may look at it and say, oh, he's just kind of being negative. But he's being real. He's being honest. He's not naive when it comes to the reality of life. He isn't living in the clouds either. He wants his readers to share in this realistic view of life in the midst of a world of vanity. And because of the pervasive nature of this vanity, it makes it impossible to rid the world of wickedness and corruption. Sin brought that. And it's a reality that we must deal with. Keep that in mind because we'll get there in a little bit. Now, this is rather puzzling, if you, if you would ask me, because if you think about Solomon, um, you would think that he would have some type of juice uh, to deal with the imbalance of society, especially um, a society and a world and a kingdom that he ruled over. If, if anybody could have fixed that problem, it would have been Solomon. Yet again, he says, don't be surprised by it. Expect it. Which again, reminds us that we live in a broken, sinful world. And a result of that brokenness and experience, it really has no explanation. And we know this. And so why are we often surprised by it? The fact of the matter is, is that we should not be surprised by sin. And in the context of money and riches, he brings this reality out. Uh, We know the character of sin, or we should know the character of sin and what it brings along with it. So as long as we are here in this vain world, we will always carry with us the burden of dealing with the fruit of that truth. And then in verse 9, he makes one of these comments that makes you scratch your head. And that happens often as we journey through this book. Solomon says, but this is gain for a land in every way. A king committed to cultivated fields. Is this talking about accountability? That every position has oversight and that that oversight will correct any uh, identified corruption? Is he talking about God being the highest one over all earthly leaders and that he is the one who will ultimately bring the corrupt, the corrupt justice to an end, that God works everything out in the end? Is this some kind of proverbial statement that is hard to interpret because of its lack of context? As I was reading commentaries, all of these were suggested. But I'd like to offer up the suggestion that this is speaking to the reality that the only defense against a corrupt ruler, uh, let's just say corruption in general, is a godly king. In, In a more general way is godliness. One who is not consumed by greed and motivated by selfish gain but one who uses what God has given, not just for personal gain, but uses it properly, uses it in a healthy way for themselves and for those who are less fortunate. And this is really pressing against the observation of Solomon that we find in verse 10 through 12, because he moves right into talking about the love of earthly riches the insatiability of those who love earthly riches. And he says that they will never be satisfied. I think we say that a lot. There's a lot of comments that we make every single day that we say that I don't think we necessarily live into or even believe. Yeah, of course, you know, I don't, I don't live my life, you know, consumed by money. I don't live my life consumed by, by the things that I gain. But in reality, you might. There's a lot of things that we say that we tend to fall into. And so you may be saying, okay, of course, you know, it's, it's the love of money that's the problem. But the reality is, is 
a lot of people love money. And what Solomon says is those who love riches will never be satisfied. Again, amen, Solomon. But is that a reality of your life? And he continues on in observing that the more a person has, the more they get to see what they have gained eventually leave. He says in verse 11, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? A man with lots of land will require workers to take care of it. That takes money and resource. A man with a large house will be required to pay someone to clean it and to maintain it. A man who makes a lot of money, the tax man will require his cut. The more money a man has, the more their so-called friends would like to relieve them of that money. And on top of that, in verse 12, Solomon observes that riches are also a liability. That the obsession of gaining more leaves them anxious about losing what they have. To fret uh, over whether their investments are safe or made uh, properly and, and, and continuing to gain. And that if they observe it slipping away as more and more people uh, tend to see this and, and more and more people want a piece of the pie, that they may not even be worried about their current possessions because they're consumed by gaining more and more and more. That they actually forget what they have because they're more obsessed with what they could get rather than what it is that they actually have in front of them. And he says, while those who have only what they need, they may not have excess, but they're fed. They have enough. And they ultimately sleep well at night knowing that their needs are met. So here's a little bit of an equation that uh, you may find interesting. Um, affluence plus indulgence equals sleeplessness. That's essentially what Solomon is saying. A gain and gain... Uh, you lie awake at night, gain and gain, and you suffer indigestion. Lovers of money are not content with daily provision. Their desire is not fixed and set on the one who is our ultimate provision. Instead, they have wandering desires and ever-growing appetites. And again, you may be saying, Jared, Jared come on, now you know. but you might. And I think this is the bigger picture. It's not just that these individuals are not satisfied. It's that they are consumed. They're owned by, dominated by, preoccupied by, immersed in something that is fleeting and vanishing. And if there is anything worse than the attention that riches demand of those who are engulfed and obsessed with them, it's the emptiness that it leaves. And Solomon speaks to this in 13 through 17, and he gives this illustration, if you will. And we see a man who loses his money in a bad business venture. He loses his wealth. If he has a son, he has nothing to leave him. He's unable to provide for his family. And he's left in the same condition in which he entered the world. Without possession. Without resource. We've all heard this. You can't take it with you. That at the end of the day, the earnings of his labor was a laboring after the wind. And that the end of his life was only sickness and darkness and disappointment. I think I shared this a few weeks ago, and so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but it's fitting. Uh, my father-in-law's uncle was a very wealthy man, very, very wealthy man. Generous, loved the Lord, gave and gave and gave, but also gained and gained and gained. He got sick near the end of his life, went into a nursing home, and his wife lost their house because of the cost that the nursing home um, 
that the, of the nursing home. All of that work, all of those opportunities missed, all of that time going after and gaining and gaining and gaining and gaining and gaining, even though he used it well, even though he honored God, it's gone. Doesn't have it anymore. And so here's something that we must come to understand. It is a sad reality to forsake living a life satisfied in Christ and Christ alone, to try to gain something that is fleeting and temporary. That's really what this text pulls us in front of. It's not sinful to build wealth. But building wealth can easily lead to sin. Uh, gluttony is closer than you might think. Pride waits for the opportunity to take over. Sin can creep into our acquisition of money, our view of money, and our use of money. And for the Christian, we are not to be easily ensnared by anything that will pull our affections away from Christ. We are to instead be aware of the trappings which can pull us away from Christ and that quickly become idols in our lives. And we must be sure that we walk the, the fine line between appropriate and God-honoring dealings and handlings and all-out idolatrous, gluttonous, prideful anarchy. We see a theme in this portion of Ecclesiastes. Although specifically looking at earthly riches, it can be seen as an exhortation to keep watch for the subtlety of sin. It's closer than you think. And so we cannot afford, even for a moment, to let anything that we are to gain, anything that we are to go after, and anything that we are to maintain a proper relationship with get out of control. You can think about this in anything. Throw it out there. You can use this idea. Anything that we are to maintain a proper relationship with. We must be careful that we realize that it's just one degree this way that can lead you into using that in a sinful way. You know, there's one degree difference between hot water and boiling water. And we must see that and we must understand that. Uh, in the New Testament, Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11.3, uh, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, that your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. In context, he was speaking to those in the Corinthian church about false teachers and how they were actually accommodating these false apostles. Those who were coming and preaching a different gospel and these individuals were giving them a space to be an influence. And notice that Paul says that he's afraid. He's fearful that their minds may somehow be led astray from their sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Anything that competes with a sincere and pure devotion to Christ will always, despite its promises, leave you completely empty. And that's what Solomon is going after. And again, we may say amen to that. But can you really say amen to that is the question. Now, in the closing verses of chapter 5, we see then what is produced in the life of someone who finds their enjoyment from the things that God gives. Uh, there's a, a balance of sorts that we come to see that the world that God created is full of many rich gifts. But the power to enjoy them does not lie within the gifts themselves. Friends, we are to reach out for the cross where Jesus gives his life for our greedy sin. 
and come to find our satisfaction in Christ and Christ alone. For if that is all that we have, and all that through the grace and the mercy of God that we gain, we're rich. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but because of the work of the cross, because of what God has afforded you through the Lord Jesus Christ, you're rich. And so when we hear in the news of the latest multimillionaire or billionaire who uh, just passed away after their life's work, all this money, anything you could think of, they had it, the life of ease, the life of not having a concern about anything that they could ever want. There were concerns I'm sure we didn't see. When we hear of their passing, may we remind ourselves that we are now richer than they are. Because they have nothing. But for those who are in Christ, because of the complete work of the cross, our wealth comes not from material things, but from the work done on our behalf on Calvary. So friends, we are rich. May we not be given over to things that fight for our attention and our affection. Because their approach and their tactic is subtle. So be careful. Pure devotion to Christ is the goal of the believer. May we rest in that and may we set our minds on that today. So Father, as we come to your word and this opportunity to study it, I'm grateful Grateful that you, through your Holy Spirit, give us a discernment that we may see where things may have be, been going too far or going the wrong direction, and that in your grace you give us the opportunity to repent from that, to turn from that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to see that this morning, to see those places that we have given our affections to, those realities that we've given our affection to that uh, are, are in actually pulling us away from you, even if they are good things, that we have somehow pushed them higher and higher uh, of importance in our lives. May we see that, and may we be reminded that you are indeed all that we need, and that when we have you, we are rich. So, Lord, would you just continue to guide us and lead us and direct us in all that we do and say, we're thankful for this opportunity, thankful for your word, and pray, Lord, that you be with us the rest of this day. We love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray.